Good evening. Um, welcome to the Ecclesiastical Law Society Northern Lecture. I am Paul Benfield, a trustee of the Society, a barrister and a priest serving in the Diocese of Blackburn. Although we are sad at not being able to meet in person in Leeds, meeting via Zoom does mean that this lecture is available to more people. I see we have 85 people with us at the moment, but in fact well over 100 originally signed up. Some may join us during the course of the evening. Kate Davy read History and Law at Christ's College, Cambridge, and is a barrister of the Inner Temple. She has practiced at the criminal bar for over 25 years, where she prosecutes and defends equally. Her cases have included all manner of sexual and violent offenses of the highest magnitude, including rape and historic child abuse matters. She also defends soldiers facing courts martial. Kate was awarded a Master of Arts in Gothic Architecture by the Courtauld Institute of Art. She is a legal advisor to or trustee or committee member of various architectural preservation and educational charities, including the Victorian Society and the British Archaeological Association. She is also a London Blue Badge tour guide. It gives me great pleasure to introduce and welcome Kate Davy to speak on Victorian architecture the Amenity Societies and the Parish Church, a Compatibility Guide. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I'm Kate Davey and I'm about to share my screen. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I hope that the welcome will still be as warm at the end of the lecture, but of course the Victorian Society is very much part of an adversarial system with um, the ecclesiastical consistory courts. And obviously nothing that I say is designed in any way um, to um, upset the good relations that we generally have with the Church of England. You, um, well, most of us know, I think, that um, we um, are amenity society between 1837 and 1914. We are the Victorian and Edwardian society, but that is rather cumbersome. Edward didn't reign long enough to merit his own society. And we take 1914 as a cutoff point, simply because uh, that is a natural break in every area of the arts and architecture when the 20th century society take over. It's a rather, sad time for me to address you um, as we speak. I see that um, about 50% of you are lawyers and we've just had the judgment in Hurst Pierpoint. As a result of having just had that judgment, I won't be saying too much about it. We are very much considering that judgment, but suffice to say that we uh, don't accept the criticisms and we are rather upset and hurt by it. Hurst Pierpoint, of course, being a um, a Charles Barry church, Charles Barry architect of the Houses of Parliament and the Reform Club amongst others. I'd like to make it clear from the start that we're not hostile to parish churches uh, and we generally have an informed and sympathetic understanding of parish needs and difficulties. I'm saying now something rather odd and talking a little bit about myself which I don't normally do. But many of us in the Victorian society and the other amenity societies are Christian, we're often Anglicans. Architectural historians and conservationists, even where we're not practicing Christians, will still be sympathetic, knowledgeable and practical. We do welcome dialogue. We do really aim to compromise in the vast majority of cases. We are experts in our field. And I do have to say the current system is in our view often failing and unnecessarily adversarial. And I'm going to make a strange comment and say we're not deranged, blinkered, demonic or loonies, um, all of which we've um, had uh, thrown at us by party opponents in various cases, I'm afraid. And I'm just pausing there. The last comment about being a loony um, was made um, by a chancellor who said as far as he was concerned, Victorian society were all loonies. Um, I put this up because of the last noise that you heard. Um, I'm afraid logistically the day didn't go as planned and I apologize for the interruption which will now stop as our dog is about to be taken out. He's Cuthbert, named after St Cuthbert. 
I'm briefly going to run through then uh, and weave into the narrative some experience um, that I have had during my life with churches, because it's often assumed that it is Christians against conservationists. And it's very far from um, the case for a lot of us. I was fortunate enough to be a cradle Anglican. Ricking Hall Superior on the right, Inferior on the left are very much my churches. Basil Brown Doug at Superior on the right. And generations of my family are buried at Inferior on the left. My earliest memory is polishing the Victorian pews in Ricking Hall Superior when I was three and four with the Mother's Union. Those pews were deemed so comfortable that when Superior went under the Church's Conservation Trust, the pews were moved off to Hinderclay and we got some medieval pews that are very uncomfortable. So uh, an accolade for the pews. Uh, we then moved to Great Barton, Holy Innocence on the left. I went um, for, um, I suppose, reasons of families belonging to different denominations. I went to the Free Church Sunday School, where the splinters were not caused by the Victorian pews at Holy Innocence, but from grubbing around on the floor of the Free Church. And at Holy Innocence, uh, we worked very much with a restored but very beautiful Victorian interior. I was in St Margaret's Ipswich in the choir, again a massively restored medieval church, restored very successfully by the Victorians. And it was one of those churches where it's an early example of removing pews that didn't matter. In the north transept there were trestle tables where we had coffee, and I still remember which way is liturgically north, south, east and west by remembering that we always have coffee in the north transept. After Cambridge, I moved to London and worshipped at Emmanuel West Hampstead. Uh, it's a church by um, an architect called Thompson, sometimes Thompson and Whitfield, utterly unknown, even to Simon Bradley of Pevsner, but indicative of how beautiful a church and important a church can be when the architect is totally unknown. And here I had my first encounter with the faculty system. It was pewed right up to the back. It didn't look great we removed some of the pews. We found then that there was a wobbly floor because the 1905 East End, uh, West End hadn't been attached to the rest of the church properly and it became a trip hazard. After I moved on and moved away, the uh, next incumbent restored the West End and look how beautifully effective that is. He hasn't interfered with the West End, he hasn't moved the font, but it's all been wonderfully incorporated. It's church well worth a visit. I spend my spare time going to churches and my favourite is the incomparable All Saints Margaret Street, William Butterfield. And currently I'm sitting here in my flat in the temple where I worship at the temple and St Peter Advincula. Well, why that introduction? Uh, to show you that we are not on the other side, we are not enemies. Whether we're part of the Church of England or not, we are part of the system. Uh, and I am certainly very much involved with the church and worship with it. And so I'd like to say to those who um, treat us in an adversarial way, please engage with us. Please treat us courteously. Please deal honestly with us. You may think that that's all rather obvious. And you'd say, well, of course, we would do all of those things if we are a parish, if we're a DAC, if we're a chancellor. But we haven't always found that to be the case. I'm a trustee of the Victorian Society, and so I'm not directly involved with the um, consistory courts. Obviously, we play a part in deciding whether to um, be a party opponent and whether to appeal matters. But I'm always amazed and saddened by how much grief our church's officer and our staff at the Victorian Society have. Here's a typical letter. Uh, Dear Registrar, I'm not sure I've had patience to reply to the Victorian Society. As a Christian, I'm commissioned by Christ to, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, not to maintain museums for the nation. I presume the diocese has some view on the concerns of the Victorian Society and as our mission as churches. Could I ask you to deal with this? And that's one of the politer letters. And uh, another typical letter directly sent to us in response to a Victorian Society comment that there was uh, no specificity in the proposal. Did Jesus have a business plan? It's our church and we can do what we like with it. We don't need meddling. Uh, I pause to say I always um, thought 
um, having um, had a look at the Gospels, that Jesus was actually rather organised. And uh, recently, our um, priest here at the temple uh, gave an interesting sermon on Mary Magdalene being effectively the bankroll behind the apostles, uh, something of a business plan there. Here's St James Bucksworth. This is a classic example of how helpful the DAC were in dealing with a parish that didn't want to engage with us. Their statement of need, statement of significance was woefully inadequate and they kept adding bits, changing bits. And the Victorian Society kept saying, please, could we have some more information? The church didn't want to engage, but the DAC very much did. And Chancellor Bullimore steered a beautiful path. And in the end, as so often happens, we came to an agreement without going to any court or hearing that the parish plan was uh, too dramatic, too draconian, and that for their needs, what was acceptable to all was the removal of some of the pews at the back of the church. And often we find the DA system works very well. Sometimes, as we will hear, it doesn't. Now, I don't want to be critical of judgments, um, but and I don't want to be critical of parishes. And it's a very difficult exercise for me this evening. But Penshurst, the classic example of really abuse that the Victorian society had. This is a wealthy parish. It has the backing of, um, certainly there's a Queen's Council in the parish, um, a very um, well-funded firm of solicitors, a very well-known um, stately home in the parish and an active um, PCC. We had all sorts of bizarre letters from Penshurst, including one that said that they were going to write to all the Victorian Society members, telling our members how we were misusing funds by opposing Penshurst and generally making other uh, rather unfortunate comments. We were also um, contacted by a very famous person who doesn't want to be named because the parish had been in touch with him or her, um, again, um, not saying very nice things about us and asking him or her to intervene. Um, he or she wrote back saying, um, in their view, the screen was the best thing in the church and they declined to get involved further. But we're always rather surprised when a parish, a Church of England, a Christian parish, behaves like this. Thankfully, it's relatively rare. But it does say something. When I discussed matters in this lecture with our church's conservation officer, James Hughes, he said, I've just remembered a lovely thank you letter I had from a parish. And it's a real shame that I remember it because it was so rare. This is St Martin Wormersley, I hope I pronounced that right, near Doncaster. And they put forward uh, the usual proposals for um, a removal um, of pews and various other alterations. James Hughes, I'm not going to ask you to read all this, but James Hughes replied with his usual attention to detail and his sympathy. He, of course, accepted the principle of lavatory and tea point. He discussed in detail the alignment of the window and said that he I thought it was unfortunate, but as there was no other obvious solution, he accepted that aspect of the structure's plan. He considered the interior fine, but he then went on to consider a cupboard, a store cupboard on the north side, and to make alternative proposals. He also asked what purpose the glazed panel proposed within the west door served, and suggested that it wasn't really necessary and it struck a rather jarring note. And you'll see at the end, he raised no objection to the disposal of pews from the West End and the South Isle, the rationale for which was clear. And that really shows how a good statement of needs uh, is, is so important. That is typical of the detail and the care that James and our other members of staff give. The vicar considered our proposals and adopted them. He not only did that, but he wrote a lovely thank you letter full of humour, jokes and thanks. And it's a bit sad that James remembered it because it was vanishingly rare. Now, I've been asked to provide a compatibility guide for parishes. Uh, so what are the cardinal rules? Well, most of you will know these. 
but I am, I'm afraid, repeating them because they are observed very often in the breach. Explain clearly and in detail what you wish to do. Why is it that you want to do it? How did you decide on this particular course of action? And implicit in that, of course, is what other options did you consider? Who did you consult? Did you talk to architects? Did you talk to experts? Did you talk to just your indigenous parishioners, if you like, the people who come to church? Or did you consult those who don't come to church, but do the flowers or mend bits of woodwork? And we all know, particularly in rural parishes, how often half the village won't come to church, but will always turn out when the church needs a wash, a brush up and mending. Did you consult the people who visit? Um, James is often surprised that he gets to a church that proposes radical reordering and they say, oh, you won't believe how many come and people come and visit our lovely church, then proposing to take out many of the um, aspects that make it lovely. What would happen if you left the church as it is? Uh, can you work with the church? One of the things that my vicar at Emmanuel West Hampstead used to say, not the current incumbent, but the one that, who was there when I was there, was that you really need to work with the architecture. He wanted a nave altar. It didn't fit in with the architecture. Our happy compromise was uh, when Westfield College threw out its portable altar, we parked that at the side. Um, I'm afraid we christened it the abomination, but that's uh, that was a joke. And uh, we used to wheel it out. He used to wheel it out for a weekday services, and everybody was happy. What have you done to assess the harm caused by the proposals, and what have you done to mitigate them? Uh, that's obviously important because um, however good your statement of need is, if you are in particularly a grade one or grade two listed church, then you need to consider um, the harm, you need to be aware of the harm, and you need to think about what you can do to mitigate. And is it part of a bigger plan? All too often, we're completely thrown at Victorian society because we get a request and then it changes and then they add something to the pews or the lavatory and then they change their mind and no one actually knows what's going on. If it is part of a be um, bigger plan, it's far better for us to know. And please find out about your church. When was it built? You may be dealing with more than one important period. The proposals to put pods on top of the temple church, which are in the pipeline, are going to be in the unusual position of dealing with SPAB and the 20th century society. Victorian does not mean of lesser value. When was your church altered? If it was a medieval church altered by the Victorians, why was it altered? Often there was a philosophy behind a Victorian um, amendment, often, uh, for example, a Puginian suggestion that 14th century architecture was inherently more spiritual. It doesn't mean that it's got to be preserved like that, but if you know why it's there, it often makes you appreciate it more, maybe even love it more. Who built it? This is not to say that uh, a lesser or unknown architect shouldn't be preserved, far from it. But if you know, for example, that it is William Butterfield or Charles Barry or Augustus North, um, Welby Northmore Pugin, then um, it's an indication that there's going to have to be a pretty good reason for altering it. Who paid for it and why? Patrons will often be as important as architects. It may be that it was given in memory of someone and has an emotional history within the church. What is its listing? Listing is not the full story. Have we explored all relevant sources? No, listing will not give you the whole picture. We often find in um, judgments, DAC comments, parish comments, that they say, well, it's not mentioned in the listing, whatever it is, therefore it clearly doesn't matter. Listings now go back many years. They are often sparse and they will very often not include fittings. It is simply not acceptable to rely wholly on, on listings. Pevsner, of course, particularly revised Pevsner. And again, is not the whole story. Guidebooks, old and new, always with a caveat that um, 
they may not be written by experts and the older the guidebook sometimes the less they had um, any um, I suppose opportunity to read the archives. Having said that, older guidebooks are often far more detailed, but you need to watch for accuracy. Parish records, archives, public records offices, and libraries, including specialist libraries such as the Antiquaries, Lambeth Palace, and Reba. They will all let in non-members who have a good reason to use, and this is outside COVID, to use their collection. And indeed, they will welcome it, and you will find the librarians really helpful. Well, a parish may say, we haven't got time to do that, or we haven't got the resources. And we have perhaps less sympathy with that because, of course, you can come to the Victorian Society and ask questions about architects. But if you are um, embarking on a major enterprise to reorder substantially your church, then we do feel the church deserves adequate and proper research. Know your church. I love this. This is St Mary the Virgin Radwinter. And this is the this is the village website. It's not even the church website. And this is um, to whom they attribute their research. Uh, you read it. It's great. The Reverend Cecil Gore Brigley, MA, as amended by the Reverend Frank Harwood, the Friends of Radwinter Church, with corrections and additions by Mr Julian Lytton of the Victorian Albert Museum, and a patron of the French, and by the Reverend Brian Macdonald Milne. I think that's brilliant. There's a church that really knows itself, to quote the Delphi Oracle. Here is Radwinter. It's an outstanding church uh, um, in Essex. And there's something brilliant about the way that this church is looked after. A previous incumbent told me he thought only the best was good enough for God. And um, that's a sentiment which um, one has um, every sympathy with. I did pause, I wasn't, I was just there as a visitor, not on any official business. I did pause when he told me that he didn't like rugs being put in from people's attics and he thought that what was best for God was a wall-to-wall -wall pink fitted carpet. Um, it wasn't, I think, installed, but um, I think his heart was very much in the right place. It is really important to get the expertise right. And here is a case shipped and Bellinger at first instance. Here's what happens when expertise yeah, is absent. The chancellor found the present church is built of brick and stone and dates from the 17th century. It doesn't actually, if it had dated from the 17th century, it would have been as rare as hen's teeth and people would have traveled um, from Australia to see it, I think. He said the architect Weathers was certainly not regarded as distinguished. Well, have a look at um, Victorian architects by Dixon and Methesius, something we use a lot. He said that the quote from Pevsner eh, as withers in top gear was a disparaging remark, which it wasn't. He said it wasn't a nationally important building. Its listing suggested otherwise. He said that building that withers was, I'm paraphrasing this, was in building in keeping with medieval precedent and seemingly therefore saying so he wasn't in keeping with the 17th century church that it wasn't. He said that he was basing his factual conclusions on a leaflet found on a site visit. We don't know what that leaflet was, uh, to which incidentally the Victorian society were not in invited, although the parish were. And he found as that the font, um, which was what the request was all about, was more in keeping with the proposals to lower the floor, which wasn't part of the request for faculty, obviously something the parish had up their sleeve for next time, rather more than the Victorian font. And actually, I think in that one, he ordered the font to be destroyed, um, but it wasn't, that didn't go through. We're not showing off, but it is the Victorian society that really does have the expertise. I've got a picture here of the late Gavin Stamp, um, everyone's friend, actually quite shy. Uh, and I like this one because he's smiling. Um, and uh, he really was the expert on so many aspects of, the Victor of Victorian architecture, including Sir George Gilbert Scott. And we have a lot of experts at our disposal. Um, here is um, past and present, an absolutely random list. Gavin Stamp, Nicholas Pevsner, John Betchman, both founder members. Lionel Brett, um, he was responsible for modern architecture, Hatfield Newtown, one of the 32 that met at 18, um, 18 um, Sanborn Avenue. 
um, with Lady Ross and formed the Victorian Society, Hermione Hobhouse. And then um, today, Michael Hall, Megan Aldrich, the expert on Rickman, who really paved the way for Victorian architectural history. And Crawford, Fiona McCartney, one of our vice presidents, sadly just died, expert on William Morris, David Canadine, Peter Howells, Robert Thorne. And I'm really sorry to the people I've missed out. And again, um, this is what happens when people ignore our experts. Michael Hall, I hope he doesn't mind me putting his picture up here. Michael Hall is such a bodily expert that he was um, chosen to um, give an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and you have to be pretty good to do that. You'll see in the lower paragraph, Michael Hall, the editor of Apollo, has done more than anybody to research Bodley's achievement, and this is encapsulated in a small exhibition. Uh, this is a rich and illuminating tribute to one of the greatest church architects of the 19th century from the Catholic Herald. Uh, here I am, um, looking a bit blurred on the right, holding up his massive book on Bodley. Um, it is a fantastic book and I'm actually resting my computer on it at the moment. In Judgment at First Instance at Penzers, Michael was found not to be an expert. Really quite remarkable. We don't decide, the trustees really take ultimate decisions on um, whether to invest funds in, in hearings, but we are guided by the heartbeat, if you like, of our architectural expertise, the Northern and Southern Buildings Committee. And here they are. I'm not going to go through them, but you can see all sorts of people whose names I'm sure you will recognise in those lists. It's actually the northern one on the right and the southern on the left. And they meet um, very regularly, usually monthly, and they discuss each and every secular and ecclesiastical application that comes before the Victorian Society. And these days we, we're very lucky that with the help of the um, Council for British Archaeology, they, we give them um, some money to sift so that each amenity society only gets the applications that are relevant to them. Obviously, some are relevant to more than one. And each and every application is then considered by the Southern and Northern Buildings Committee. They are, if you like, the hardcore architectural experts. We sometimes, as a board, will step back and take a view um, that is a little more in the round, although the, both the buildings committees are very sympathetic to parish needs. As a little example, St Augustine Kilburn, marvellous building um, in uh, northwest London. They are grade one listed, Pearson's best church. They wanted to put mobile masts on their tower. The buildings committee said, oh, it's such an important church. We're reluctant to allow anything. But in consultation with the trustees, we said this is a poor parish in a very poor area that takes great care of its marvellous building. And we should have some latitude. And we didn't oppose that application. Uh, what on earth are these two pictures? Well, there seems to be, I'm afraid, a bit of an attitude that Victorian architecture is expendable or that one can say, well, only need, we only need the best examples of each architect and we can bin the rest. We often hear that it's always the Victorian society that troubles the, um, the diocesan system. Uh, of course it is um, because there is so much um, mending and restoration done in Victorian times. I don't buy the argument that there's more Victorian architecture and therefore it's okay to dispose to, of a lot of it. That argument um, was often used in terms of hunting the African elephant and now it's on the endangered list. And this picture on the right, I don't know if you recognize it, it's um, Michelangelo. It's the only Michelangelo in London's National Gallery. Now, to my mind, it really isn't very good. Um, I really can't tell what's going on with this figure who um, looks like he's about to fall over backwards. But no one would say, well, it's lesser Michelangelo and therefore, hey, we've got plenty of other Michelangelos in the world. Let's get rid of it. And I'm always uncomfortable when parishes pay people and, and the experts who act for the parish often are paid. 
pay someone to say, well, it may be Scott, it may be Butterfield, it may be Charles Barry, but it's not good Butterfield, Scott or Barry. I find that um, a very unattractive argument. It's only Victorian. It's a view no longer held by the vast majority of people, but seemingly current amongst some aspects, I should have put, of the Church of England. A great friend of mine, presenter at a cathedral, told me that in his previous parish, he was delighted to find that his book, uh, box pews were 1842 because that meant they were Victorian and he could get rid of them. Had they been 1836, oh dear, um, he would have felt that he couldn't have tried to get rid of them. Uh, actually, they were 1837, but never mind. Kenneth Clark, an amusing introduction to his book on Gothic revival, says that when he was at university in the 30s, I think, people would deliberately have Sunday walks to Keble College, Oxford, so they could have a good laugh. And they thought it was designed by Ruskin rather than Butterfield. That attitude, I think, is on the way out. And you don't need me to give you wonderful examples of Victorian architecture. It's only Victorian, St Pancras. After we lost the battle for Euston, the Victorian society came into being, St Pancras was next. We had a, well, oh, goodness knows, several decades of fight to keep it and then to have it restored. Can you imagine now that this would be knocked down? It's only Victorian. These magnificent churches, Bodley, um, Hall Cross, Staffordshire, top left, St Augustine's Kilburn, top right, Pearson that I was talking about, his wonderful comment is that he wanted churches to bring people to their knees. I love that. And uh, bottom left hand corner, St Giles, Cheadle, Cheadle, perfect Cheadle, my only consolation, as Pugin said. Uh, it's only Victorian. We don't just deal with Gothic revival. We have absolutely nothing against zip wires, uh, but we do have something against zip wires that go between grade one listed buildings, Liver building, we've got the St George's Hall, the library, and a memorial garden to the Hillsborough disaster victims. They wanted to put a zip wire straight over that. Loads of people objected, but the Victorian Society was the only charity, only group that challenged um, the uh, Liverpool Council and the mayor, and the mayor was persuaded to withdraw. And finally, one of our biggest uh, victories recently, uh, twice we have stopped the general market, the west side of Smithfield, being knocked down. Uh, this is different from the meat market. This was the general market, fruit and veg and things, by Horace Jones. The cast iron pillars are um, unique in that they are the first of their type. Um, I'm no scientist. I can't explain that any further. But this is a, um, an internationally important building. One public inquiry wanted to demolish it entirely. The next one, there was a bit of facadism and uh, we were invited uh, to agree that we could keep the rind around it with a big brown brick featureless office block in the middle, called in for public inquiry and uh, with Save Britain's Heritage, I should add, who played just an important part. We won, now it's going to be the Museum of London and now the City of London are promoting it uh, as if it was their idea, even though they opposed us. A frequent objection that we hear when we um, make representations or oppose something is, well, Historic England haven't said anything, and we find that in judgments as well. Historic England's views are not better and do not trump that of the Victorian society. Historic England would agree with that. It is not given greater weight by the faculty jurisdiction rules, that's Historic England's views, and should not in practice be considered uh, by those operating the system to be more important, although it is often stated as such. Historic England inspectors have far less specialist knowledge of Victorian Edwardian arts and architecture. Some inspectors, none at all. That's not to criticise them. They are employed to look at all buildings, all ages, um, all types in their area. The Victorian Society has a dedicated churches officer. His, whoops, sorry. Historic England operates across all types of England or uh, buildings, but within a limited geographical area. Historic England is chronically underfunded, aren't we all? And its remit is ever widening. It cannot respond to everything. 
does a fantastic job, but it operates in tandem as a complement to the amenity societies and is often surprised and saddened that a lack of response from them is used against a conservation argument. Uh, God doesn't care what a church like, um, I was told a couple of years ago. Um, I can't comment on that, I don't know. Um, but the law does, or it does if it's applied correctly. Um, if your church is listed, if your church is architecturally important, if your fittings are architecturally important in the context, whether by a famous architect or not, if your church is in a conservation area, um, if your church is by an important architect, um, then churches are entitled to protection. Uh, they're as entitled to protection as their secular counterparts. Church of England has been granted the privilege of ecclesiastical exemption, only on the understanding that it will protect its buildings and apply its rules fairly and rigorously. Um, so that really, if you are, for example, um, a clergyman or woman of the Church of England, that is the law. And it's not the case of us being... Um, anti-God, um, taking an atheist view of architecture, or um, anti-change, which we're really not. But it does come with the territory of being part of the established national church. More advice to a parish, read the documentation available. And I've just taken randomly on the London Anglican website, there's a whole page um, in, in terms of the index, and then an absolute book on London seating. I would recommend that there is some system in place to ensure that clergy and PCCs have read and complied with diocesan directions because we too often find that they haven't. Arguments that should not be used according to such documentation as the London Diocese one in the last slide, but still frequently are, are that we're putting a church back to how it should be we're putting the church back to how it was, that the Victorian church uh, did not understand proper worship, um, and I find no evidence of. Architectural history is complex and takes years of study. Um, in Penshurst, for example, um, one of the findings at first instance was that the um, screen, that we, there was no evidence there'd been a screen there in the 15th century, or well, firstly, that wasn't really the point. But secondly, the chancel had been restored and rebuilt after the Reformation, and therefore one wouldn't expect to find the usual um, upper and lower apertures that one often has, or the damage to masonry, whereby one can see where the screen went. Um, so be very careful if you're um, making pronouncements on architectural history. Uh, a church as it used to be. Um, well, uh, this is a bit of a naughty slide, isn't it? What do you mean? Do you mean a really small church, um, Eskham, Durham, it's gorgeous, by the way, on the left, uh, where most of the congregation would stand outside, uh, probably under a similar tree. Uh, it, there will be no light. The clergy would be um, quite hard to see in the gloom uh, and room for virtually none of the congregation. Do you even mean if we really take it completely back to basics, a room in a house in a Roman villa, uh, whitewashed, little access um, to all importance placed on women uh, and always uh, fearful of the outside finding out what was going on. And I absolutely refrain from drawing any comparisons to any churches today. And be very careful what you wish for. Um, okay, you will say, don't be ridiculous. We're not arguing we should take it back to Eskham or um, Silchester. We're saying that we take it back to the worship as found um, at the time of the church as it is now, often, more often than not, perpendicular. But that doesn't really wash. If you take, for well, your argument is usually, let's take the pews out. They didn't have them in uh, the, at the time our church was built. It isn't right. But going with that territory would mean a big screen, the clergy very far at the east end. You certainly couldn't have a nave altar, for example, um, by the Fourth Lateran Council, 1215. It was absolutely settled, um, both transubstantiation, the real presence, 
and that the altar was pushed right back about with the um, east end, flush with the east end, and that the clergy would celebrate with no or minimal participation by the congregation who could scarcely see, let alone take communion. So really the argument that we're, we're taking out the pews so it's it, the worship goes with the building just doesn't wash. Here's a quotation from Professor William White from the Church Times. Uh, uh, when they say, well, the Victorians didn't understand worship. Above all, the Victorians bequeathed their understanding of the church to us. We still see these buildings as active. We still expect them to do something to us. I love that. It's one of the great paradoxes of the modern church that our arguments about buildings are couched in exactly the same terms and drawn precisely the same assumptions as the Victorians. And that really is so true although it does demand um, really quite an in-depth um, study of Victorian, not only architecture, but also philosophy. And just I've thrown in a reminder that uh, you may have to deal with more than one amenity society here. This is wonderful Bristol, but it is uh, like Hexham Abbey, half, half medieval and Victorian. And just, I always like to put in a picture of John Betjeman, just because he makes me smile. Here are some of the founders of the Victorian Society. Well, what about pews? It's often said that we spend our entire time dealing with pews. If you're a member of the Ecclesiological Society, you'll have had this whopping great book for free. Do read it, it's brilliant. I don't agree with all of it, but it's still brilliant. And we do get a little bit fed up by, by pews. Um, we love them, but we are absolutely happy to consider removal, um, often some removal. We consider pews on merit. We are not wedded to every Victorian pew. We really wish Ambridge had thought of something more interesting than pew removal, and our um, previous director two, two ago, Ian, Dr Ian Dungavel, um, sighed and said, well, I better wade in on the side of the Ambridge pews, but I really wish that they'd, they'd come up with a, a, a more interesting reordering. Victorian society will often agree to partial removal of pews in appropriate circumstances, and you saw that when I was talking about um, Wormersley. Uh, let's see, and indeed um, in the church of Boxworth too, it's often the case that the pews don't need removing in their entirety, but what the parish need is, is met by removal of pews at usually the West End. We're often hampered by a failure to engage about partial removal. We suggest it and we just don't get anything back from the parish. And it shows the importance of a full statement of need and a statement of significance. If you just want to have the odd harvest supper and coffee and maybe a messy church, it is often enough to take out some or make some room at the back, uh, done with great success with some Victorian pews at Blakeney, for example. Here's a quote from the Church of England. There is a presumption against, um, against the removing or altering of any pre-Victorian and especially pre-Reformation seating. This is from the Church of England website. I find that a bit sad. I'd like to see a presumption against removing or altering any um, seating, say dating from before um, World War II. Uh, but let's look at the arguments that are put forward primarily back to how it should be or was, uh, and that's a fallacy. Pews in England date from freestanding pews, the 13th century, they weren't very comfortable. There were stone seats in the wall before then, Rickinghall Superior, my old church, although we don't think that's actually where the phrase came, the weakest go to the wall. Comfort and flexible space. Well, I'd like to say some things about comfort and um, pewing. Pewing is very common by the 15th century, almost universal um, by 1600, and therefore much of the life of Church of England we have seen pews. Pews were built by the Victorians with regard to comfort, sight lines, and egalitarianism. It's the Georgians, in fact, who had those really awkward, uncomfortable and exclusive box pews. And it tends to be the medieval pews that are so narrow they tip you off. Victorian woodwork is of just as good quality as any other period, and the Victorians really built to be in keeping with their church. I'm just going to show you a slide for a couple of seconds. 
Uh, what's your abiding memory of that? That was Attleborough, um, St Mary. And I know that blue is Mary's colour. But actually, what um, was in that picture was one of the best medieval screens in the country. You will have noticed only bright blue seats. And again, St Luke Maidstone, did you notice the really spectacular double pillars or did you just see a sea of bright red? Upholstered chairs are most often um, unsightly and they will need constant refurbishment if anyone sits on them. Uh, if they don't, then you wonder what they're doing there. Wooden chairs are not the great panacea that they are said to be. And I'd like to make a few personal comments here. I've had more types ruined by going to St Paul's Cathedral on those saintly chairs that were at the very fashionable at the moment, the ones that you slide around on made of wood with, with metal frames. If you put pews together and fix them together as you have to do, otherwise they just get really messy and all over the shop. Actually, that can be quite uncomfortable. I find particularly as a woman with men spreading out, it's far easier to find your own space on a pew. And pew comfort can often be resolved, sanding, polishing, and putting decent cushions. We often hear complaints that pews are really uncomfortable because a congregation is very small and therefore they hold the services in the choir where at least the front row and sometimes both rows were designed for children. So it's not surprising that they're really uncomfortable and I've had to resist being put in um, front row of, of choir stalls quite often. Have a look at the article in that pews book by Jonathan um, McKenzie Jarvis and the rest of the book. Um, he writes from a DAC perspective. I said that Victorian woodwork was of a good quality and um, I hold by that. This is Wilburton. I put it in because I went there, didn't tell anyone what I did, didn't mention the Victorian Society. I was in a holiday cottage down the road and I went to their morning service and I was bowled over by this woodwork. Pevsner, the revised Simon Bradley version, so the editor of Pevsner, now thinks that it is George Gilbert Scott Jr. If it is, it is vanishingly rare. Um, and I'm not surprised it's such good quality. It was interesting too, because I commented as one does over wheat coffee and rich tea, that it was a stunning, nature, stunning church and beautifully kept. And they said, oh, we love it. Um, and we love our pews. And then voices dropped and they said, but some people want to get rid of them. And I thought it was an interesting, um, com they didn't know who I was. It was an interesting comment that often um, the wider church parishioners and congregation aren't always consulted. I looked on the website and they still seem to be there. There was some jolly music played on Facebook. Uh, long may they continue. And the Bath Abbey pews. Well, George Gilbert Scott Senior, grade one listed. We were promised by the parish that they would be looked after. Um, this is where they are now. Um, and they are being sold off and they're not in particularly good condition. And look at the cushion on the pew on the left. It's not surprising that the argument was that they are uncomfortable. You could have put a really comfortable push cushion on there. And some more examples of just how wonderful Victorian woodwork is. On the right is um, Dulwich, a chapel at Dulwich. On the left, I'm afraid I can't read my notes. I'll get back to you. There are very few experts on Victorian woodwork. Uh, the star Victorian architects considered woodwork, pews, screens, pulpits as an important integral part of the building, not an afterthought for a jobbing carpenter. And the use of correct medieval precedent was common. So questions then, we would like detailed justification for flexible spaces. Do all the pews and screens have to be removed? What difference will it realistically make? Will there be a deluge of bookings for messy church concerts, arts exhibitions? Can tea and cake be accommodated, for example, in an aisle? Can messy church be held at the back of a church? Will the space really be used flexibly? Or will the same six parish stalwarts leave the chairs neatly or less neatly in pew position? Will there be another need for change in a few years? And why does the Church of England not follow up on reordering? That's a bugbear of mine. We're always told that it's going to increase income and um, bums on seats effectively. But there's been, to my knowledge, no follow up to see if that's true. 
Whole churches are usually these days um, safe. Here's a poster from um, oh, 30, 40 years ago, Holy Trinity Bingley. But that's not always the case. Here is SS Tulon, vanishingly rare architect. He's had um, quite a lot of bad luck. Uh, and St. Peter's Birch in Essex is still in grave danger. I don't quite know what's going on. I think the church commissioners want to demolish it, even though there are proposals for its conversion. And um, happy story, the Drake at Font. Uh, this is by Burgess, and I've put it in just to show that it's just as good to my mind as um, anything that could have been done in previous centuries, even though Crackfield, one of my favourite fonts. Um, we won this on appeal to the um, Court of Archers. Uh, the parish wanted to sell it to what turned out, although he said he was a collector, he was actually a dealer. I put this in to show um, where we're certainly not here to have a pop at parishes, and most of them are lovely. But sometimes it's not the parish that's the problem, it's um, the DAC system. Uh, St Uni in Lelat in Cornwall is um, uh, primarily or often by Sedding, so an important architect. And the parish had a really radical proposal to do all sorts of things. Um, it wanted to fill in the arches and, and really change it completely. The Vicksock objected, Historic England, CBC and the Ancient Monument Society. We heard nothing. We were then told eventually when the parish put in some more requests that the Chancellor, I think it was, had um, said that the um, faculty was granted unopposed, which it, of course it had been uh, opposed left, right and centre. And when we spoke to the parish uh, about it, they really went along with many of our proposals. So the system can fail often in more than one way. When we questioned what had happened, we were told that our objections had been taken into consideration and the other objections, which didn't lie easily with the fact that um, it was uh, said to be unopposed. So we don't know what happened there. And here, Again, there was a breakdown in communication. St. Moran, uh, Le Moran, uh, this is by White primarily, uh, had a back problem. It proposed putting in effectively a mezzanine floor. Uh, we weren't notified. And in fact, when we said, well, you don't need to do that, you just need to put in um, another layer effectively in the roof, the parish said, great, we'd, we'd far rather do that. We do want the best for congregations. We are always sympathetic to applications for lavatories, heating, health and safety compliance, and accessibility. Sometimes these things are simpler than they seem. At Holy Innocence Great Barton, one of my churches, they had lots and lots of schemes for disabled access. And then we found you could actually simply drive around to the north door, which hadn't been opened for centuries, uh, park outside, minding gravestones, and someone could walk straight in on the level. But of course that's not normally the case and we are always looking for compromise. We believe far more can be achieved with better engagement with the amenity societies, joint conferences. We had one in York about um, rural churches and the problems and we think that everybody needs to get together and take churches, take listed buildings, central stage and make a political issue of them. And Victorian churches are not incompatible, we argue, with any type of worship. You can have an imaginative use of space. You can put your drum kit, your bouncy ball screen at the front of the church. You can change things without destroying and you can work with rather than against the architecture. One of my favourite churches is St James the Lest, George Edmund Street, who did the High Court, um, the Royal Court's Justice. And here you can see, if you look in the right hand picture, there's drum kits uh, and the Hammond organ. Um, if you went behind the red curtain, you'd find the squelchy bean bags. It is low church. I don't know if you call it evangelical or not. I can remember when I started studying Victorian architecture when you couldn't get in it. Um, you would actually sneak past and hope the door was open to burst in, run round and run out again. The vicar now is wonderful. The church and parish couldn't be more welcoming. They're proud of their church and yet they um, worship in a low church style. It is difficult though, we do find, um, I don't want to sort of 
be an evangelical basher. It's certainly not my style, but I would just like to um, refer to uh, St. Augustine, Queensgate, Kensington, London, Butterfield. Now, I refer to this because we did compromise here. We compromised quite a lot, actually. We had a lot of pews hacked about into pewettes, and we really came forward to meet the parish because they wanted a centre for the homeless. It is, though, um, a bit galling when it is so hard of access and a member of the church, uh, sorry, uh, an employee of the Church of England went to have a look at it about five years ago and was told the immortal words, um, this is a church, you know, we can't just let anybody in. I love that. Well, sorry, we need to talk about Duffield. Perhaps not tonight, but we do need to talk about it. What we have found in the court system is that the parish needs are now always found to be greater than the harm, however significant the harm is. So if you like, and if you see me, it's always bouncing, however great the harm, parish needs to, found, to, to, found, to be found as slightly greater. The Court of Arches will frequently, that's probably the wrong word, sometimes correct judgments at first instance, for example, finding that um, Michael Hall wasn't a bodily expert, but they're markedly reluctant to stop the parish reordering. And what we find in Court of Arches judgments is that they will find for the parish, but on rather more reasonable um, grounds, not grounds we agree with, but um, less, less combative uh, and unpleasant. The requirement is uh, exceptional. And the parish needs, um, we often find, are not exceptional. They are the fairly bog standard needs for a bit more space, messy church, um, etc. Even when the harm is to agreed one list of building and or by outstanding architects, the parish needs will always come first. And here um, is Duffield, bearing in mind there's a strong presumption against proposals which will adversely affect the special character of a list of building. Uh, will any resulting public benefit, including such matters as liturgical freedom, pastoral well-being, opportunities for mission, and putting the church to viable uses that are consistent with its role as a place of worship and mission, outweigh the harm? In answering the question, the more serious the harm, the greater will be the level of benefit needed before the proposal should be permitted. This will particularly be the case if the harm is to a building which is grade one or two star, where any serious, where serious harm should only exceptionally be allowed. Well, there's nothing wrong with that statement, but there's everything wrong with the way that Duffield is now invoked always um, in our experience to find that the um, benefit is exceptional, the parish needs are exceptional, and they always trump the serious harm. And uh, this is in discussion uh, with our staff, and it's a sort of um, synthesis of um, views expressed. Our staff really are delightful. I've never known them be rude or horrid to anybody, and I've only ever had one complaint of rudeness by someone in the Church of England system who said someone whose name he didn't remember was rude to him 15 years ago, and therefore he wouldn't deal with the Victorian society ever again. However, here's our synthesis. It's easy to find cases where, where we and our advice have had a positive effect. It's depressingly far easier to find cases where our advice has either been ignored, addressed, or dismissed. And I pause there to say that we have a mole in a diocese in the Northwest who tells us that um, they simply say at DAC meetings, oh, we've had another objection from the Victorian Society, quote, put it in the bin with the others. If we were to crunch some numbers, uh, carry on with the synthesis, I think we'd find the society loses most cases which are challenged. Of course, we do not expect to win all cases, but a system in which we lose nearly all of our cases seems to be broken. In cases in which heritage harm to significance is weighed against needs justification for harmful intervention, the church's proposals nearly always win out. This despite the strong presumption against harm that chancellors are obliged to take into account. So we're not angry, we're not cross, we're just sad, and sometimes we do slightly despair. I appreciate the difficulties. Consistory court judges are expected to cover a very wide range of cases, very few of which relate to architectural conservation. The vast majority of cases seem to be relating to burials, remains, exhumation, wording on tombstones, 
dad and mum as against mother and father, clergy behaviour sometimes, Irish texts on, on tombstones, whether they need translating, and a variety of matters unrelated to architecture, art and sculpture. I was speaking to one chancellor who told me that he didn't think that my type of, of concerns constituted even 5% of his caseload. The law is very, very complex. It's inaccessible to most, even by lawyer standards. Uh, I was invited with our previous director to um, the Ecclesiastical Judges weekend in Oxford a few years ago and was allowed to sit in on an update from the then Chancellor of Oxford. And I was just gobsmacked. It was so complicated and I'm a lawyer of 30 years standing. And I'm not surprised um, that the whole system seems inaccessible uh, to the average parish. Oops. Chancellors must be practicing in communicant Anglicans. And I would argue, I'm afraid, and I'm not suggesting everyone is, is deliberately biased, but there is a conflict of interest inherent in the system. The Victorian Society, like many charities, doesn't have any money. However, strapped for cash, the Church of England is, it has far more resources than the amenity societies. COVID is making the problem worse. Our one church's officer considered over 500 applications last year. The Victorian Society is often the only chance a building has to be preserved. It's just us often standing between the building, its fittings and destruction. 19th century studies are currently unfashionable in university and expertise is in short supply in academia. Our experts, volunteers and staff are thinly stretched. And it was a volunteer architect, for example, who went to Leland and had a good old chat with the parish and sorted it out. We would like to see special panels instead of one um, consistory court judge with a range of interests and expertise judging heritage cases. We would welcome a closer dialogue with the Church of England and we will be delighted to offer training courses and lectures or to invite you to our events. I fear though that that isn't going to happen just because of this adversarial system and because you say well if I come to one of your events I'll seem uh, to be associating with the Victorian Society and there'll be a perception of bias which I would argue there is anyway if you are um, part of the Church of England. We would like to work together to make representations at a national level for the preservation of our heritage. This cannot be left to a dwindling number of congregations and a few small heritage charities. Ultimately, it's no one's fault. England and Wales have an unrivaled collection of world-class buildings and our church buildings are a major part of that heritage. Other European countries pay a considerable amount towards the upkeep of their churches whether they're used by congregations or not. Germany imposes a voluntary tax for the upkeep of their churches, which most people, regardless of belief, seem to pay. We would like to see more pooling of resources between the branches of Christianity in England and Wales. Sharing of buildings for services would benefit both the buildings and the congregations. Of course, that's in a liturgical, ecumenical sense, as well um, as a heating bill sense. And above all, we see it as the state's responsibility to help to look after our heritage with the admirable health of the Church of England and the amenity societies. Now, I was very sorry not to come to you live. Um, I would have liked to have spent the day in Leeds to go to your art gallery uh, and to have a look at your town hall and to visit your marvellous churches. So here's Leeds Minster, Leeds Parish Church. I understand that the vicar there is lovely. I understand that there's reordering in the pipeline and I look forward in a positive sense to taking that forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for a stimulating and challenging lecture. We have a little time for questions. Yes, James, then could you come in, please? Yes. Um... How, how frequently has the Victorian Society been asked to pay, ordered to pay costs because its, because its intervention was considered unreasonable? Um, oh, um, I will have to ask our church officer that. Um, not often. The issue of costs is, is a bit odd. Um, the weirdest one I know was Drake when we won in the Court of Archers. 
and they still made us pay costs for reasons we, we absolutely haven't got a clue about. We think it's because they thought we had more money than the parish. Um, as for costs for, um, no, I can't think of many. We, in the Court of Arches in Penshurst, obviously we lost, but the judgment was completely revamped. I know that's not the legal word and therefore we, we didn't pay costs. Um, that's not a very satisfactory answer, not very often. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can see Paul Hutchinson has his hand up. Paul, would you like to come in, please? Yes. Just to repeat something I typed in chat, really, which is um, if the appointment as chancellors of practicing Anglicans has inherent bias in it, why is the creation of special panels, which are full of people who no doubt have uh, um, focused interest in the subject matter in question, why is not that not an equivalent bias? I mean, I don't accept the proposition that uh, practicing Anglicanism uh, makes one biased in the first place, but wh why does the second not uh, display similar bias? Um, uh, thank you, Paul. I, I saw your comment. Yeah, um, obviously, we, we don't think um, that all DAC people and chancellors are biased um, by any means. And we don't think that there's an active bias, but it's just it, it is, I think, a conflict of interest. I don't propose replacing um, chancellors with an expert in Victorian architecture. What I propose is having um, more than one judge having a panel uh, with a mixture of people who know about um, Victorian or whatever it is, architecture, with somebody like a chancellor um, steeped in the law of the Church of England, with, and I say this with some hesitation, lay assessors, although I'm mindful of um, their um, shortcomings in other areas such as lay magistrates. Uh, I don't propose one person. One person, I think there's always going to be something of a problem but I can't think of any other area where the system runs itself and decides on heritage matters when it, each chancellor is part of the system. That's not to say they're all actively biased. And some of the comments I've given to you do show that the adversarial system does breed quite a lot of unpleasantness from the more unreasonable parishes. So I think it's a bottom to top problem. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Eyre, please. Yes, this is, a, I suppose, a, a comment rather than a question, but uh, I share um, the concern about some of the comments that are made about the Victorian society. I had to uh, deprecate an incumbent in Litchfield who felt he could get away with making disobliging comments by putting them in uh, New Testament Greek. <laughs> which I'm sure the society were well aware of as well as I was. Uh, the, the, more to the point, though, my experience is that on cases where the society engages fully with the parish, uh, a lot of the heat goes out of the matter. But there is a concern in cases where the society uh, raises an objection to a proposal, but where the perception on the ground is that the objection is not based on a detailed analysis from the society. And I'm very conscious of the society's limited resources, but I do wonder if one way forward might be for uh, the society to be focusing its attention more narrowly on the cases you really want to object to uh, and not making what are sometimes seen as just boilerplate objections to other cases. Yeah, a number of points there. Um, I, I do see that some parishes think that we don't understand, I think, to put it. And, and as I said in my talk, we do. And you'll see from the response um, that I um, showed you, although I didn't read right the way through it from Wormersley, how detailed our considerations are. I agree that um, ideally we would get there and negotiate, although the system is expressed at the moment in terms that a site visit isn't necessary in all cases. We do try and get there. Um, whether that actually helps or not is a moot point. I'm afraid we were copied into a thread in Hurst Pierpoint where one church warden wrote to the other saying, I've written to the Vicksog inviting them to come, but I really hope they don't. And the other church warden replied, yeah, hope they don't. Um, good luck with that. So um, a site visit isn't always a way of um, 
improving relations. I just think a detailed response shows that we've thought about it. If the parish doesn't agree, fine. Your question, should we narrow our field? I can't agree with that um, because it is, it's a judgment call. Um, if you say, well, we only um, respond to grade one or grade two star, uh, there's a lot of beautiful churches out there that um, need some input and actually might welcome our input because that's the point. Some parishes just didn't really think about what they were proposing. We say, well, sure, kitchen, kitchenette and the lavatory is lovely, but why don't you do them with the wood that's in keeping with the rest of the fittings? No problem. So I think engagement, and there are some churches with whom we will never be able to engage who are actively hostile, but I don't think it is right that we narrow our parameters to, for example, certain listings. I, I don't think that would be responsible of us. And I think that we would be hanging a lot of places out to dry. But thanks, good point. And I will Thank pick you. you up on the New Testament Greek. I'd love to know um, uh, in New Testament Greek insult. Thank you. Uh, I think this will probably be the final question uh, from Paula Ward, please. Hello. Um, I was just sorry. Can you hear me, Kate? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you thought about the possibility of setting up as the Victorian Society as an advisory group. So the parishes don't just meet you when it comes to a faculty application, because one of the most worrying things for PCCs is, is the maintenance and conservation of the churches that we have now and the dwindling money that we have. Mm -hmm. So perhaps and that might perhaps help towards it being a less adversarial process as well, because we already know you, we're already familiar with you, and you've already hopefully given us advice. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is a really good idea. Um, it's really about resources. Again, we um, would love to advise and we will if we can. If uh, a church rings us up and says we're just clueless, um, not about the, the system, but about the architecture, we would be happy to advise subject to our resources. And although our church's officer is, is just that, other people who work there, we have North and South secular um, caseworkers, we have a director, we have a Midlands caseworker, uh, and we have an administrator as well as an events officer. Um, we would do our best even if you didn't get hold of the right person. We may too be able to direct um, a parish straight to an expert. Um, so um, yeah, a particular architect, if there is one, we may be able to say, Sure. One thing that we are a little concerned about, um, and this is why we don't do it, for example, advising people which paint to use for their Victorian house, is that um, lawyers will appreciate what a minefield that is. If we, do you remember the case of Best of Bell Paints? Um, if we advise um, using a certain paint and it all falls off mm -hmm. in 10 years time, we've got to be very careful there. But I think any engagement, any lessening of the heat, any change to make it less adversarial from beginning to end, top to bottom, is a really good idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's gone half past seven, so I think it's time to uh, draw to a close now. Uh, Kate, thank you so much for a stimulating and challenging uh, lecture. Uh, I don't know if you've been able to follow much of the chat going on underneath while you've been speaking, uh, but there have been some good points uh, made there. Perhaps afterwards you'll be able to, to read through and, and perhaps think about some of the good questions which are being raised there and comments there. But you've given us a, a very stimulating talk. Uh, we've, you've introduced me to some Victorian churches which I didn't know, or medieval churches with Victorian features, so thank you for that. This lecture will be available in due course for us to look at again on uh, the Ecclesiastical web, website, so please uh, do look at it again if you've missed some parts of it. Um, I do, on the chat, you even got a little spat going between the Archdeacon of Pontefract and the Archdeacon of Doncaster, <laughs> whose jurisdiction Romersley came in, uh, but I think they sort that out now. Um, thank you so much uh, for your preparation, for your time, and for your uh, delivery. Uh, finally, before I say goodbye, can I remind you that next week, a week today, we have the next lecture. This would normally have been in London, but again, it will be on Zoom. It's the Reverend Dr. William Adam on communion and jurisdiction 
and, and part of the evening will also be the annual general meeting of the society. So if you haven't booked in for that, please go onto the website and uh, book in for that. Thank you everyone for your attendance. I hope you've enjoyed it. Normally now, if we were in Leeds, we would adjourn for a glass of wine. So you'll have to go into your own kitchens and find your own wine. Uh, so safe journeys to your kitchens. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening and good night.